the first big obstacle that we faced, the first large one, uh, was when our third co-founder left f- for the first year. Their business is to invest in startups. You're a part of their business. Without the startups, they wouldn't exist through text. And we built the whole mobile game and the whole business around it just by communicating on Skype with text. I couldn't see other students not being able to actually try entrepreneurship for real. Uh, because I felt as if people got the wrong impression of entrepreneurship. Uh, and that hurt me because I really liked entrepreneurship and I, I, I promoted it to everyone. I wanted everyone to give it a shot. But then people had this this view or this picture of entrepreneurship that I didn't th- think was, was um, fitting to reality. Because we realized that we needed these types of courses in school. Uh, we had just taken a entrepreneurship and business economics class in school and we really didn't like the content or the learning materials that our teachers shared with us. Welcome to the Bullshift Club. Let's make this shift happen. Well, this is going to be an amazing episode, everyone, because I'm joined by someone who I just met a few months ago, but is doing so many amazing things, especially for people like me, as you know, who is constantly involved in 10 to 15 things and truly believes in being community-led. I'm joined by Adrian from Ferrando, who is doing some amazing things with his co-founder at Ferrando. So Adrian, I'd love for you to be able to introduce yourself and tell the audience everything about you and what we can know more about you. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, my name is Adrian or Adrian. Uh, I'm one of two co-founders at Ferento, and we help coaches and educators create and sell online courses. So we ourselves began as course creators and recently, just two years ago, pivoted into helping others succeed with their online course content. I love that. And we'll get right into it because it's always amazing like when you're doing something and then you realize that you know what let's just make something that can actually solve certain problems was that the same case with you and was that the same thing that happened like what why did you want to start creating a platform instead of just creating courses mm. so initially when we began creating courses it wasn't to build a large business um it was because we realized that we needed these types of courses in school uh, we had just taken a entrepreneurship and business economics class in school and we really didn't like the content or the learning materials that our teachers shared with us. So to change that, we ourselves built new learning material and sold it to schools around Sweden. And doing that, we quickly re- realized we have to build our own platform from scratch. We cannot use any of these other tools because they're too complex, too priced, or just lack features that we really need. So we didn't think more of it. and then. A few years later, we happened to connect with other course creators and then they mentioned the same thing. They also have a hard time finding tools they can actually use and they end up using a handful of different tools just to create one course. Um, And that's essentially when we decided to start building this instead. Uh, We realized that the market for our courses in Sweden was too small. Uh, Even if we had sold this course to every single school in Sweden who had entrepreneurship classes, we still wouldn't make enough money for it to be worth it. Um, So then we pivoted into not only creating the actual content, but being a distribution channel for the content. I love that. And since, you know, the podcast is called The Bull Shift Club and we'll be having a lot of words with shifts, I love how you made that shift, how you pivoted from not just, you know, starting a platform for creating courses, but realizing Mm. that the value you yourself were getting was not up to the mark. And I can personally resonate with that a lot because when I started out, like I started designing when I was in high school. And Mm. I remember that most of the times I would look at these design books, these design institutes and everything, and they lack the education I needed. So most of my design education literally came from meeting experts and just mm. learning stuff from YouTube and just practicing and that built that yeah. experience. And when I started to educate people in design and you know me because of that, because I have a platform on yeah. for enter now. And the, the main thing I focused on was about the, not just focusing on the tools or just, you know, learning what a tool does, but rather how you can mold it and how you can actually mm. express your client's emotions and so much more through your creative sources. And now I'm not just yeah. involved in design, like I'm all into branding and everything. But yeah. I would love to know why did it matter so much to you that these courses weren't there? Like, what was the point that caused you to shift and realize that it's not enough for me to just get this? And maybe I can learn from myself, me, you, and your co founder. You could have learned it for yourself. But what made you think that it's not enough to just do it for ourselves? I think when we realized that the platform we have built to put in our content was better than the actual content we created, we realized that the product we created is is bigger than whatever we started building initially. Um, I don't see any case where we could have added content and created courses that would make this course creation tool actually worth it. Um, 
so that's essentially when we realized that we need to share this with others and have others use this tool too. Yeah, but I'd like to like I was trying to understand a lot more in terms of mm. the early stage. Like when you started just creating courses, not the tools, but mm. when you started, what made you want to create courses? Why were you like you know? I know this. I get that the value is not li- valuable over here. I can get it from other places. Why was it important for you to be able to create courses so that others around you can also learn, can also get the value they needed? Why is that important? Mm. Um, for us, it was important because I saw many other students in just my class, but also in other schools, uh, they didn't have uh, the chance to to actually build their their company. So, so how this class works in in Sweden is you have the chance to start a fictive company in school for for one year, and we quickly realized that a lot of these companies, a lot of these students, are not able to actually pursue their entrepreneurship dreams because they're held back by these tools. They need to spend x amount of hours each week in class just listening to the teacher reading this material um, which was just too theoretical um, i couldn't see other students not being able to actually try entrepreneurship for real uh, because i felt as if people got the wrong impression of entrepreneurship uh, and that hurt me because i really liked entrepreneurship and I, I i promoted it to everyone i wanted everyone to give it a shot but then people had this this view or this picture of entrepreneurship that i didn't th- think was was um, fitting to reality I love that and thank you so much for sharing that mainly because that's the thing right like it's the passion the love you have for this field where and I don't think field is even a right word like this journey to be honest mm. it's some not everyone obviously a lot of people are now starting their businesses but to truly be an entrepreneur to truly dedicate yourself for a particular purpose that's what I truly consider entrepreneurship when you're putting yourself out there instead yeah. of the entirety of the comfort cause there's so many opportunities out there that are lined up but you're taking an entirely difficult and different path so that you can create something that is going to bring a lot more value to a lot more people so mm. i love the reason and the way you went about doing this i would like to ask you like was there at any particular time while you were doing building for into and you or your co-founder felt like this might not be worth it or were you ever facing any obstacles within yourself mentally where you felt like is this it is this going to be something any challenges and how did you manage to overcome them like what were some of the challenges mm. and how did you get you and your co-founder or how were you able to just deal with that process and overcome it mm. uh, i think that the first big obstacle that we faced the first large one uh, was when our third co-founder left f- for the first year so at the beginning we were three people it was me lucas my current co-founder and then a guy named yukke Uh, and he was a teacher within entrepreneurship so he was our ceo and he was the one who uh, created content and kind of led us forward or so we we kind of believed uh, we ourselves saw ourselves as dumb teenagers uh, who were lucky enough to work on this project with someone else who guided us right yeah. uh, and then six or eight months in um, this third guy left he said he he wanted to pursue other things and focus on other stuff and this was still during the school year so we still had to run the company for x amount of months uh, but i remember uh, not thinking we were going to pursue this uh, post this class or, or continue after the class uh, for at least a few weeks or months uh, and i don't think we actually worked on overcoming that um, i think it just kind of shook us and then we just sat there not knowing what to do but we were lucky enough to to be in these competitions for for this entrepreneurship class that we got to meet other entrepreneurs and compete within entrepreneurship uh, so first locally we won a few prizes for best innovation of the year and um, best company of the year uh, and then we got to go to a national competition and meet a lot of other uh, both students but also teachers we met all the teachers who who run these entrepreneurship classes across schools in in all of sweden so we were able to pitch them and then sell them Uh, so we doubled the amount of schools for the next year and then we had a, a reason to continue uh, to to actually help our, our clients uh, so i think that was how we overcome it i love that. overcame it yeah did you ever have a conversation about this later with your co-founder lucas that maybe we don't need someone else maybe we are enough maybe you're doing it right and you know what let's keep at it did you ever have something like that yeah several times several times now these past years i don't think we ever ever talked about it um uh, after that maybe for one two years yeah. but now for the for the past time we've we've spent some time talking about that yeah and how do you feel when you bring up these conversations and 
you look at it not as a point of like oh my god what are we going to do next but rather oh that happened now we have overcome it how how did this conversation go you can you share that Mm, I think a lot of the the conversations now is talking about how we felt because we we never had the conversation done right uh, so talking to each other about how we actually felt when this happened and I think we both had kind of the same reaction uh, so we kind of uh, bombed it over that yeah. uh, but other than that I think we we just laugh at it uh, we look back uh, we laugh at how how anxious we were um, and the fact that we we almost didn't continue uh, yeah that was bad and really just loving the energy you're bringing right now in terms of just a world journey because it is difficult starting a business mm-hmm. is difficult and especially when you do something with a partner and you're obviously not completely relying upon someone but you're collaborating with someone and you distribute these tasks so that it's easier for you and when yeah. someone drops out for some of the other reasons and i've been on board sides i've been in places where i realized that even before we start something i was like you know what i might not be able to do this so i drop out of mm-hmm. things and i let the people know and i've had two founders or partners leave midway through the process when we really needed them and everything and i know the fear mm-hmm. but yeah. it is really difficult but it's also an amazing feeling when you're able to not just pick yourself back up but continue thriving and you're not just in yeah. survival mode anymore yeah okay. absolutely yeah so uh tell me this if there was an if they if forento never existed if you never thought of this idea what would you be doing Uh, I I have no idea. I think I'd still work together with Lucas my co-founder and just build things on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> I Yes, I got. Yeah, I I think so. We we started working together in 2017. Uh we built a mobile game uh which is also very different from creating a platform for online courses. Uh so basically it's for us always been about or at least for me it's always been about the creation process. Uh what we're creating uh, is not as important Uh, though of course it is but the the process of creating something uh, and of course on the internet because we've we've always been right yeah. uh, we built stuff on the internet since our early early teens from minecraft servers to to web services to e-com stores right so i think i'd i'd still work with something uh, from home uh, on on the internet yeah. uh, but i really can't tell you what <laughs> so when did you start like uh, how old were you how many years ago was this like when you start putting things out there on the internet like and just realize that there's a whole, whole other world out there yeah i i think i was about 13 uh, maybe 13 14 and it all started with minecraft uh, i wanted to create my own minecraft server and was able to do so together with great developers and and great team members uh, so we built a minecraft server and i think that was where i made my first ever uh, actual money online um and then from there it just went on uh, i began with uh, e-commerce after that uh, and did that for a, for a whole few years during during high school i love that I, it's so fun right like you start off with one thing and that kind of keeps linking to something or the other unexpected but down the yeah. road when you're at a place you look back and you see it all connect in some way or the other Yeah, I I had no idea back then that this was entrepreneurship or anything close to it. I I just wanted to to create something cool and and make money of it. Uh I didn't think any more of it. So I I don't think I realized until maybe in high school that this creation process or or creating stuff online was actually um creating businesses or creating products. Uh, that was when I realized, I think. And what let's talk a bit more about Ferento. Um mm. what do you see Ferento to be down the road? I know that there's a lot of things going on personally and if you're okay sharing out love for you to tell us what's going on with Ferento right now but what do you have planned yeah. for the future Yeah so we we have a lot of cool features uh, being planned um as advertised on our website we're working on a advertising manager for example but also a lot of other small uh, features that are coming out So right now we're in a stage where we've been in in beta for almost a year or more than a year and we're starting to work out of beta Uh, we're trying to decide what does Forento actually need to to be out of beta. Uh, what will we consider not being a beta version anymore? Um so I think that was would be the most important part. We're actually working towards a fully um advanced version of of Forento uh, that would be public to to anyone on the web. Uh, that that's really interesting. I'm really looking forward to that. And what what's the most important thing for Forento for you like What makes Forento Forento as for you? That that's a really hard question. Um 
Pronto for me is is our team uh, and our community of users. Uh, we have a really strong connection with our users, uh, basically because of the live chat that we have on our site. So we, we're able to talk to users and creators all day. Um, so I think it, it's the it's the community, it's the creation process. I'd say still, um, both from our end creating Ferento, but also our users actually creating stuff. Uh, the whole concept of Ferento is enabling creation, right? Uh, so I'd say that was uh, is what Ferento is for me, creation. Love that, and I think it's, I love the way you put it, enabling creation, because that's literally what I saw when I came across Ferento, and I said, yeah, this platform is not just a post builder like all the other things out there, not gonna name any, but it's the ability to truly be able to connect with your community, be community led and tap into various forms of education. Because it's not just that you're creating a course or putting up a worksheet or it's not limited to one or the other. But rather yeah. you get to connect with your community, you get to build things with your community and I keep sending people over, I'm like Check this platform out because there's so many possibilities over here in terms of mm. what can be done with the platform. That's really cool. I really appreciate the kind, kind words. Of course. If there was something you wanted to do with Forento in terms of a pivot or something like that, or did you ever consider making a pivot in terms of what Forento could be, or was it something else initially and how you made that pivot if you ever did? Yeah, I, I think the, the most obvious point of, of pivoting in, in our story is of course going from creating courses to creating the, the actual platform for courses. And then I'd say there's been a few small pivots, but not in the same sense as where we actually changed our whole business model and product. Um, initially, we had a lot of assumptions about who is our customer, why would they use though, and how, how would they use it. And a lot of these assumptions turned out to be true, and a lot of them most turned out to be incorrect. Uh, I wouldn't say they're pivots, it's basically just how we build Ferento, right? We have an assumption, uh, we show it to people, we try it out, and then based on feedback and data, we, we try to either validate uh, or uh, disvalidate the, the, the assumption. Um, so we're doing pivots every day in the sense of small features, but the largest one I'd say is, is when going from actual courses to a course platform. I love that. And, you know, the VIC, the culture in your company, and obviously I've only met you, and I've talked with Lucas via the live chat and everything, but just the culture that you have created at Ferrand, where it's about balancing everything, but also mm. enabling potential for people. I think that's very crucial mm. because a company's culture, especially for me from, from a brand's point of view, I think that's more important than creating a logo, a visual identity and any of those things. Because yeah. who you are at your core is what is being communicated. And that's what I always tell to all of my clients as well. A brand is who you are and mm. branding is you know, just amplifying everything of it. It's your yeah. purpose and your personality infusing together. And when it comes to a corporate or a business and it's not just focused on an individual, it's the culture that is created, where mm -hmm. people with similar mindset come together and cultivate that with everybody else who's joining them on that journey. And it's not just with the company's culture, but with the customers. And the company is like the trunk. And so if your culture is authentic, it spreads through and then it branches yeah. out with every customer, every audience member that you turn to. So yeah. it's really valuable and I love seeing that because I know that it's not a branding approach and everything that people consider when they're taking, but when it starts authentically, it, it's the base for creating something that's going to really outlast any competition, mm. any market differentiation that comes in. Because if your team is strong, if your trust is strong, if the loyalty exists, then it's easier for you to be able to scale and make any and all changes as per need. I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. I think it's it's very hard to communicate externally uh, what your company uh, actually is. Not 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 about your product or or your actual value prop, but communicating what a company is. Uh, as uh, right now, when you asked me what is Ferento for you, I, I I barely could answer the question. And I think it's because communicating the idea or or a, the the feeling you get from a company or the culture is really hard. Um, and it often seems forced when doing so. Uh, what would you say is is your best tip on on actually communicating your your culture or what you believe in, your beliefs for your company and your vision without it being forced or seeming uh, seeming fake? I think personally for me, it's all about being consistent. 
and mm. just be you don't have to be perfect about it like if just like how I was doing it was hard to put it in words it doesn't need to be perfect it doesn't need to be this cookie cutter like you know perfectly iced cake and everything mm. it just needs to make sense to us but the more you do it the more active you are with it and the more naturally it comes up like let's say someone just randomly asks you a question and what comes up right away that's the consistency within you the authenticity mm. and the more you do it the more it is embraced by people and then it's more talked about rather than you speaking about it and i've seen that happen like for me a lot of people in my network know that i'm a dog rescuer and mm. i don't know if you know this but uh clubhouse was the huge hype for a while and i was very much yeah. over like i love the platform that's good great and i was like spending like eight hours of sometimes on a day over there and yeah people started to know that and so anytime anybody would share so you talk about something or the other and if they would bring up anything related to dogs you'd be like archive what do you think about this mm. archive, if and if i ever have to leave like oh archive has to go rescue a dog or something like that and That's, that's really cool, yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's really cool. That's really brand building also. And it, it's um, very authentic in a way. Yeah. Um, and I guess, like you're saying, that's something you can build through consistency. Uh, talking about Clubhouse, though, I'm, 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 I was also a really big fan uh, for the, what, two months it was, um, it was active. Uh, I went on now uh, a few weeks ago and I couldn't find a single room uh, with entrepreneurship or anything close to it. Um, I scrolled for maybe five minutes and I couldn't find anything. So I think a lot of the, the early entrepreneurship or business uh, conversations that were held on Clubhouse is, is totally gone since a few months after it's launched, right? I don't think I um, see anything over there anymore. Uh, it was a great platform initially. It made innovation occur for other platforms as well, like Twitter Spaces and everything else. Yeah. But yeah, it was an uh, entirely amazing feeling that time. And I think it played yeah. a huge role with the development I have been able to make in terms of my community. Because Clubhouse was the reason mm. I even have a friend to account now because I launched my first course on Clubhouse and we got like a thousand students in one week. That's really cool. And yeah. so that was the best part. So the the ability to be able to connect with people played a huge role. And yeah. Yeah. So if there was any particular thing that would ever be a challenge to you in terms of not just business, like in terms of just, you know, your personal journey, how would you ever go about dealing with it? Like if you ever faced something like this previously? If there was just a hindrance, a mental block, or you felt like there's no way out of it, how do you go about dealing with it? Because you seem like someone who's extremely creative, who's constantly experimenting with things and just trying to see what else can be done. So when you face limitations, what's your approach towards it? Yeah, it, it's a really hard question uh, because it always depends on the case, of course. Um, but I'd say most of the time I try to turn to someone I think I can trust with the issue and hopefully uh, not only maybe give me advice, but also maybe help me with it. Um, so it's all depending on what type of actual issue it is. Uh, often I turn to my family, of course, uh, because you can always get the support and, and help you need. And then some advice uh, too, if you're lucky. Uh, but then uh, whenever it's about business, I usually just turn to my co-founder uh, and how matter large the issue is, we can always sit down and talk about it and somehow find a solution to it. So I, I think uh, that that's my first step. Try to connect with someone who I think can help me with the issue or can support me uh, going through the issue. Um, and then I'll take you from there. And as an entrepreneur, uh, do all the other entrepreneurs who are listening to the podcast go going through challenges, inspiring themselves and looking for some sort of way they can fully scale or make a pivot in their journey. How would you, what would you tell them if you could, to, if they wanted to make a shift, if they wanted to mm. make that goal? So for anybody who's been inspired, like aspiring to be an entrepreneur, what would you tell them? I, I think, uh, make sure you actually believe in it before you make the shift. Um, ma- make sure uh, you believe in what you're doing or no one else will. Uh, and you have to be naive uh, or maybe sometimes even dumb to, to believe you can change the world in order to do it. Uh, and I think that goes for, for smaller things as well, uh, matter it be a, whether it be a sm- small company, a product, a course uh, or a book you're publishing. Um, make sure you actually believe in it uh, so others will too. Uh, and if you have to be naive to do so, then go ahead. I love that. Honestly, that's going to be one of the posts we create from this podcast and everything. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. But it's really great because 
I love that. Like obviously, right now I'm writing my own book. It's going to come out in a few weeks and everything. And the fact that not everybody I've seen these entrepreneurs and they don't think that their product is and big enough to make an impact. They just make yeah. something for the sake. But and that's great. Like I love the creativity. But when that's fine. Have, yeah. Yeah. But when you have that belief within yourself and in the things that you're creating, there yes. It can make a change, which is going to impact the world, no matter how yeah. small or big it is. It is going to make an impact, and it doesn't need to be for the entirety of the world, but rather yeah. on your community of users. That's when it plays a huge role, because now people can truly be inspired. Because that's the thing. Like when we talk about someone, we feel inspired by, because we know that they can make that impact. So when we truly mm. start to position ourselves and look at ourselves from the same perspective, yeah. And provide that value for us of course it's all about self worth when it comes to anything yeah. and when you can truly just value yourself and see yourself as someone who can bring value to others and create huge impact for anybody who will be joining you on this journey through your products yeah. through your company or either as an employee or a customer it's going to change their world and through that yeah. you'll be making a change in a community of users who is going to make a small dent in the world but it's still a dent in the world Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh I don't think you, you you don't have to change the world to build a company, right? You just have to align your goals with what you believe. Uh so don't don't aim to build a unicorn if you don't actually believe you can do it, right? Um that that's that, that I think that's the conclusion. I love that. Is there any particular thing you'd like to ask me or anything you would like to know about me in terms of the podcast or just as an individual? I I'd, I'd like to ask you the same question you asked me. What is the first thing you do or or rather how how do you tackle it overall uh whenever an obstacle stands in your way whether it be personal uh, or connected to your job or anything else? Well, for me I have gone through an individual journey of my own and because that I have been able to look at myself from a lot of both and pride not in a negative way but more of in a self-worth way. So the first mm-hmm. thing I always tend to do is look at myself and just say that I'm Arkay and I can do it. So like that's my thing. Yeah. Don't worry, I'm Arkay. I can take care of this. But the That's awesome. <laughs> I would I would generally like to see that imagine this stunt if this has been dealt with. Mm. How would I tell the story again? That if if I'm hmm. talking from a past point of view that yeah, we face this challenge but then we overcame this so easily and everything. How would I tell that story? and i like to analyze it from an outside perspective and when i realize mm-hmm. that okay i can do something that's great if i don't feel like i can do anything i like to let it sit there if i have the time and then i go about asking people i ask yeah. people and even if it's not someone who is in the same situation i like to talk to them because mm-hmm. and i say this to all my clients as well when they tell me that you're not from our industry how can you help me I'm like that's the best thing because i can give you objective views that might not relate to you directly but also views that you might not be seeing at all but that are coming yeah. from an external point of view so like to talk to yeah. people maybe just go randomly read books watch some things mm-hmm. but look for imagination or innovation and just inspiration from places where it's not supposed to come because mm-hmm. i'm just looking to analyze and absorb it first if you can't embrace the challenge first it's going to be hard for you to really start solving one problem whereas it's a lot more deeper at the end of it mhm yeah that's that's really interesting i think that's a really really good approach it sounds like you've been be thinking this through and and trying it out just facing a lot of problems <laughs> <laughs> that's cool that's cool but yes and honestly i was facing that very recently as well uh we are coming very close to the launch of my book and I was wondering, am I good enough to be an author? I'm hmm. like, I've got everything done. I've got the government paperwork done. The publishing yeah. is ready, and I'm like, am I good enough to be an author before I send it out? And that's when it's it struck me that I have done so. There's a reason this book exists. There's a hmm. reason for the choices I made, and it's yeah. because of that that now I'm doing something. And hence yeah. this exists. It's not just a random thing that I'm doing, but there are a lot yeah. of things that have come into motion that have played a huge role. that are now impacting this decision that i'm making how, how did you tackle that that situation where were you uh, just paused and and started thinking am i good enough to be an author i reached out to my clients whose books i've designed I'm like hey you know nice. book cover and i don't think i'm supposed to be an author and they're like do you have help us design our books and it looks amazing i was literally texting mm-hmm. with my clients and we are good friends now and she's a recurring client 
I sent her that and I'm like I'm nervous that I might not be a good author I'm not supposed to publish a book and it's like it just happens but you have provided value and you know all my other community members so I'm someone like do product testing with everything I do so mm-hmm. I actually launched ebook a while ago before the physical book came out as well nice people yeah people would actually buy the product that I'm creating instead of just putting it out there and people yeah. bought it so it did exist that everybody i told that hey it's going to be a 30 dollar book and everything they're like yeah it's worth it the value you're providing and the quality it is coming in it's amazing yeah. so sometimes you just need to be reassured and it's hard to do that by yourself but once yeah. you hear that and you're like oh yes it is me <laughs> that's true yeah it really helps it, yeah. it really does it, i i think maybe to to some people it can sound strange uh, but it does help yeah. um i'm i'm in the same situation i think that's why I prefer to work with a co-founder. Um yeah. I think uh, everything becomes a lot easier just having someone uh, who will reassure you that you're on the right path or you're building the right thing. I really think so. I love that. So, uh can you tell me in terms of entrepreneurship if they kind of we got into all, everything an entrepreneur can do in terms of the approach and when they're facing challenges and what what they should have in mind when they're starting a project or starting the company. But According to you, what do you think makes an entrepreneur? What is? I know there are no more. I don't believe that there's a set rules that you need. I obviously, I don't believe in the whole degrees and all those things. I feel like anybody who has a set of factors in them that they tend mm-hmm. to dedicate and like obviously factors are bad words. I'm just not trying to reveal anything just yet. But according to you, what makes an entrepreneur? I'd say someone who who loves to create and is creating something. Um as long as you're creating something and providing value to someone I think you're an entrepreneur. And then if you want to call yourself that or not that's totally fine by me. I think artists um are entrepreneurs. Um I think people who do art are entrepreneurs. Uh, maybe the the largest kind of entrepreneurs or the most entrepreneurial people. Um as long as you're creating something for someone I think you're an entrepreneur. Uh although I think a lot of people don't consider themselves entrepreneurs even if they are. But I think for me that's that's enough. And what do you think is the differentiation between an entrepreneur and someone who's the founder and someone who's running a business? Mm. I think it's it's different from being a business owner. Uh just because you own a business doesn't make you an entrepreneur. Um I've often connected entrepreneurship to innovation. I've been biased to to connect entrepreneurship with creating stuff online. Uh but no, I think a traditional business owner is very different from an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur is someone who creates something. A traditional business owner don't have to create something. You can be a business owner without actually creating something new. Um so I say that's the largest difference. Um you can be a CEO uh or a owner of a business without being an entrepreneur. I love that. And the, what was your shift like for you because you're an innovator, you're a creator and then you also now run a business. So obviously there's a change in responsibilities. You're not just supposed to work in the business but on the business and all of those other stuff yeah. and the legalities, the paperwork and all those things. Yeah. How has that been for you? Uh, I really don't appreciate this this uh, type of work. Uh the ad, admin based work in in startups is uh, something you have to do. Um you will make it to a point where you can hire someone else too and I'm really yeah. glad we've been able to uh, especially for accounting and, and stuff like that. But yeah, there there's a lot of admin work which I really don't appreciate. I started a business to to be creative and and build products and talk to users, uh not to do paperwork, right? Yeah. Um so I think it's it's consensus among all <laughs> entrepreneurs that uh, you'd rather not spend time on that, but I guess you have to. Yeah, I think it kind of makes you sometimes a lot of people end up missing the creativity. the innovation yeah. the being in that room and yeah. then you feel like maybe you're not doing what you love and then that takes away the passion you have for the business but yeah. how do you find that balance i know you're in the early years and everything and so how do you find the balance where you're not being crowded with the whole admin tasks the meetings and all those things and you actually get to build what you have in mind Yeah, I I schedule my day to have at least 2 to 4 hours of productive work. Meaning during these hours I don't take calls, I don't work on any admin stuff. I try to do stuff that will bring front of forward. Uh whether that be planning a new feature, 
trying to understand how users are using a already existing feature um, or, or other type of stuff that will actually make Frento go forward. Uh, but other than that, uh, my, my day is open uh, and all of these hours, especially now during the past few weeks uh, due to us raising more capital, has, has been doing admin work. I love that. And yeah, I know the feeling. It's honestly, <laughs> I try to distribute my work day in such a manner where I get time to coach, I get time to strategize, mm. run the agency. And I'm glad that I have been able to do that because yeah. A lot of my friends, a lot of my peers also, they not they don't have the ability or they don't have the leisure to, mm -hmm. like I have 40 hour work months. I just work sometimes 40 hours a month on mm -hmm. one particular thing and that's how I've been able to distribute things and still be able to scale. And I think that's really cool, yeah. management plays a huge role because if those things are not in order, like I think every creative person requires a bit of structure, something that will yeah. hinder them, but something that will rather empower them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's a hard balance, right? Uh, because you, you can add as many processes as you'd like. Uh, you can add enough processes to a company to, to make it go from a $100 billion company to zero in, in two days, right? Um, as, you, as you mentioned, it's, it's really easy to, to limit creativity by inserting processes and, and rules. Uh, for us, uh, we've made sure to only include the rules and the processes that actually work for our business. Yeah. Um, we, we don't follow any of the set processes provided from, from people who are outside the business, uh, such as examples, let's say an investor comes to us uh, and, and says, uh, we have these processes uh, and then you need to follow them as a company. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure we just say no to the investor. Um, yeah. We, we, we have our, our culture and our way of working and it wouldn't work with any outside processes, especially corporate processes. Absolutely. I love that. I think that's a big thing, right? Like a lot of people, I think that's a big hesitation for a lot of companies as well. They feel like if an investor comes in, then they're going to lose a lot of their creativity, their vibe, yeah. their enjoyment. And I think investor market fit plays a huge role over here because you need to yeah. know if the investor is your right partner, it's not just someone who's giving you money, but someone who yeah. aligns with your value, with your passion, who sees the vision that you see. And even if they're not yeah. able to see it just yet, they're willing to trust you and support you throughout the journey, but not have you yeah. change. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's it's really hard. I think, as you mentioned, it's, it's about finding the right investor. Yeah. Uh, one of our investors always say this, uh, an investor is like an employee you can't fire. Yeah. And it's, it's very true. They're on your team and you can't do anything about it uh, uh, unless they actually want to. So, no, uh, it's, it's really important to choose the right investor. But I think it's hard to because when there's money on the table, it's, it's really hard to say no. Yeah, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, Sorry, I, I want to ask you, what, what is an entrepreneur for you? I think for me, an entrepreneur is someone who is willing to see that what they're doing is not just for them, but it can go beyond them. I think mm. personally for me, an entrepreneur is someone who has like, we. so our, our agency Aculus has, a, our studio is always called the Lighthouse Lounge. And mm -hmm. the reason it is called that is because clients come to us, people come to us uh, because we see something in them that even they are not able to see just yet. We are seeing mm. a vision that we are now going to be shining light on for them and their community and everyone. So, mm. and as an entrepreneur, I think every founder is seeing something that the others around them haven't seen just yet. It might not be the greatest thing, it might be something small, but they know that by picking this up, by pointing this out and working on it, they're creating an impact. And so, yeah. I think that's what makes an entrepreneur someone who is willing to admit to themselves that yes something is there that they see and it's not mm -hmm. just a random thought it's not just something it's worth risking their time resources and energy because time is extremely valuable you can't get that you can have as much money as you want but you can't get back the time true yeah so someone who's true. willing to put that out there yeah i'm ready to agree with you i totally agree <laughs> yeah and yeah, uh, to go back to what you said about, you know, investors and everything, I think one of the biggest things is that we need to look at investors as partners and it's just like picking mm. a co-founder, like they need to yeah. be right for us and we need to be right for them because obviously they come from a point of experience and expertise, but they also, we also need to be willing to embrace that, but also see someone who's willing to embrace us as well. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's very true. Yeah. Um, I think 
it's it's easy to believe that investors are helping companies. Um, I, I guess they are, but it's a business transaction too. Uh, their business is to invest in startups. You're a part of their business. Without the startups, they wouldn't exist. It's really easy to believe they're just lending a helping hand yeah. uh, rather than uh, them going into a collaboration with you. This is their business. This is what they do. They do invest in startups. You don't go to them uh, and ask for money. You go to them and pitch your startup in hopes that they'll be interested and, and want to bet on you. So I, I think uh, a lot of people need to, to change how they look at investors and, and yeah. how they treat their relationship with their investors. I love that. Honestly, it's such an insightful conversation that most of my sentences are starting with that. I love that because it is so va- the value you're providing. And of course, a lot of entrepreneurs, like this is a saying, right? Like not a lot of entrepreneurs get to go more than the first six months. Most businesses mm. end in the first six months. And we have a saying in my design circle, every founder that I know in the design community that it's your first three years that are going to be the hardest. Your first mm-hmm. year is figuring shit out for yourself. Then the second one is where you're making shift happen. And third one is when shift is finally taking place. Things are finally okay. coming into place. And we have seen that because most of us, we like obviously we had very early success six months after we started. And we kept going in. But that led to a lot of pivots. And right mm-hmm. now the point we are at, it's of so many different opportunities that we didn't see come through. We didn't think would be a part of our journey. Like, I personally thought that my biggest impact would be that I'd be helping businesses create brand identities and visual identities and create brands that they align with by actually helping them actualize their brands instead of creating something else for them. But Mm -hmm. the work we do now, the impact we create, the niches we focus on and how we help them scale, it is just a whole other feeling. And I never thought that I would be linking back to this in some way or the other. I, would not, I never thought that mm-hmm. I would be back in this place. That, that's really clue. Cool. That, that's yeah. really interesting. It, it goes back to, to having an assumption, right? Yeah. I believe this is who my customer is. I believe this is what I'm going to create. Yeah. And then being proved wrong um, on feedback and data or whatever it could be. Uh, yeah. Being proved wrong on an assumption like this is really interesting. Uh, yeah. Mm. yeah. I would like to talk about Ferento because I don't think everybody knows about the way for it works because I know there are only two people who are building this amazing platform right now and even to see what it is like when I came across for and I saw that wait it's just you people it's just these you guys I mean they're amazing because a lot of people think that when they want to start something especially developers obviously the developers they know how easy it is to make stuff but then yeah. the business aspect is different for them but a lot of businesses or people who are curious to start businesses they feel like we need so many things in place we need hundreds of these things thousands of that and I don't think that's true yeah. I think you obviously can start off at anywhere, but if you're yeah. dedicated, you can build what you need. Yeah, I, I really believe so. I, I think you can build anything as long as you believe you can uh, yeah. without any form of outside help, uh, whether that be investor money or taking on consultants or whatever it could be. If you believe in something, go ahead and build it uh, because most likely you can. Yeah. So how did that happen? How does that happen right now in terms of, you know, two people coming together? How do you guys manage your workload? How do you guys distribute tasks how do you deal with burnout mm. and just manage yeah. everything else because it's not something basic that you guys are building the amount of complexity everything that exists in Forento and the features you have they're amazing so how I'm do you really go about creating yeah. that uh, I think it's it's easy because we're two very different people uh, in the way where what we work on is very different uh, Lucas my co-founder is a full stack developer he handles everything uh, code based I myself can I can't write a line of code uh, I'm unable to I've tried to learn several times and just given up so it's it's n- not common for us to have a situation where we're working on the same task or where we're unsure of who's gonna handle this it's it's pretty it's pretty clear. Uh, first of all, we have this place where we're both very different or this situation where we're both very different. But then also we have ownership over different parts of our business. So for example, I'm very aware that it's my job to make sure the investors are happy. I need to update them on what we're doing, what we're building, our progress, our metrics. Uh, whereas I know it's not my job to handle the website integration or fix this bug when it comes up. So it's it's easy for us to, to understand who is going to do what. Uh, and we're almost never in a situation where we have to argue or delegate tasks because it's uh, understood. Yeah. yeah, I think that plays a huge role because yeah. I've seen this a lot of times, small businesses where there are people who, who do a lot of same things. 
they end up crossing yeah. boundaries and it, sometimes it comes from a point that they want to help but sometimes it mm. comes from a point where they feel like the other person is incompetent because yeah. the more you're involved the cluster can cause a lot of feelings to come up and the stress because obviously there is stress there's good stress there's the bad stress there's admiring rush and there's so much yeah. that happens but i think when you can set proper boundaries and you're able to delegate and trust someone that i leave this yeah. to you and it works well when you really are not involved in that thing and you can't get involved at all then that's the best thing because <laughs> i say yeah. this like i i suck at developing as well i'm a bad coder i can't code anymore i used to know html mm. and i can't do that anymore at all and yeah. so whenever we even now it is we work with other collaborators in the development aspect i tell them what i want when we collaborate when we have the strategies i never tell them how i want it. i let them do it on yeah. their own i never involve myself we collaborate we brainstorm in what the final product should be everyone mm. comes together motion designers videographers brand strategists and everyone we all come together we plan things out and then i stick to brand strategy i stick to the yeah. amplification the app activation of it the brand identity but i don't go into i don't go to a ui designer and tell them that hey make the pretty, uh, product developer design this or something like that like i don't tell them like i want you to make this and then make the product developer do that that's yeah. their part i tell them what i want but i never tell them how i want it to be and anything at all so yeah i totally understand what you mean i think it's it's a luxury where if if you work with people who are really good at what they do yeah. uh, you can completely trust them to to do their thing right uh so yeah i i, I can see the situation um yeah. and it's a, it's a luxury situation because i think it's it's hard if you're not in a situation where you trust your team members or you don't trust that they will do this to the best of their ability it's it's a really hard situation because then you kind of have to get into it you have to look at what they're doing you have to get your hands dirty and get involved yeah. uh so as long as you work with people who you really trust will do this to the best of their ability and will really perform and who are the best at what they do then hand it over to them and and trust them with it and it's going to be a lot better than than if you got your hands dirty and got involved i think i love that uh, well, i'd like to ask you a bit of a personal question when since we're talking about trust and everything as for you what does it take to build that trust with you or with someone cause and i would like to know how you and lucas ended up connecting i know it's not that you met in a business convention you guys have a relationship from the past and yeah. how do you manage the both professional trust as well as your personal trust and how do you make mm. sure it doesn't mix and merge in a bad way but rather amplifies each other and adds to each other mm. Mm. i think um, i don't have any secret recipe for building trust uh, yeah. for me i think it it's uh, mostly based on time i think yeah. time is the largest factor uh so working together for a long time will build trust uh, as long as that relationship works as as should yeah. uh for me and my co-founder we met on Skype uh, in 2017 or 2016 so it was not a business convention it was not uh, a co-founder matching service uh i reached out to an old friend of mine who i know knew from minecraft who i knew was a developer and i asked him do you know anyone who makes mobile games or know how to, knows how to make mobile games he connected me through with lucas and then we chatted through skype for our first year we we never had an actual conversation like this we just chatted through text and we built the whole mobile game and the whole business around it just by communicating on skype with text uh, and i think that for me uh just this this process uh, over years working together from mobile games to doing courses to doing this yeah. uh and other side projects as well is is what's it uh, that that builds trust um uh, and i i cannot give you any any <laughs> secret recipes unfortunately no that's all right i think you literally give the best thing out there which is you need to give the time you need to be able to put that trust out there like you ask your friend and because your friend recommended someone and obviously connected and you make sure that yeah this person can build what i need but yeah. because of the ability to let go at certain levels that okay i'm going to let go of these tasks to you and be able to build that i think that's the best way to build trust is by actually letting go of something first that's really interesting yeah, yeah. yeah. i agree with that that's really interesting <laughs> yeah so since we're coming to the end of the podcast and honestly it's been a delightful conversation learning about for and to the shifts you have made and just the amount of things that go into being an entrepreneur being someone who's building something so amazing if you could hear one thing from a user what uh, that would make you feel like okay i did what i wanted to that i've made something good i've made what i had in mind like what is that vision that you visualize that someone would say to you that yes this is the person i made this for this is the impact i made this for what would that be 
I'm, I'm really happy when, when users reach out and tell me about their business. The, the fact that they built a whole business based on Frento using the software that we built is, is to me in, incredible. Uh, that's why we built this from the, from the beginning, right? To enable people to be creative and, and create what they want to do. Uh, and a lot of times you get screenshots. This is my new platform. This is what I'm building. And it's really cool. But for me, it's uh, it's extra cool when someone has not only built a platform, but a business. And they tell me, oh, I made this much money this month. Oh, I'm going to be able to quit my job or I'm, I'm going to focus full time on courses. Whatever it could be, when, when someone's able to build a business uh, using the tools that, that we provided, um, that, that's really cool. I love that. I think that is very much similar to what we have with our agency where we see our companies be their best self and they are no longer trying to be something else but rather they're being their proudest self they're working with the people they want to they're creating the impact they want to and they're having mm. fun when they're able to do all sorts of weird things and they're able mm. to have a lifestyle where their priority yeah. is not making money like uh, my priority is to be able to have fun with my dogs my uh, mm. very good friend uh, i've met her a, a while ago and we keep connecting and her priority is to have vacations to be able to enjoy mm. her life so yeah. our priorities are not set by money or any of those things but rather what we want to do and so yeah. being able to see my friends or my businesses and every client that i work with be their mm. best self and not have to come to me again for a same challenge that's what i love to see because i say this none of my creative students will ever come back to me to ask mm. me about the same problem again because they know how to tackle yeah. that now they know how to overcome that and it's kind yeah. of like what you're doing with them as well with all the best you're helping them see how they can enable their creativity in a whole new way and how they can activate it further you know we're literally mm. just creating a platform where obviously courses are being built communities are being built but you're allowing people to visualize what their business can be or the start of their business can be yeah i i think we're we're same in that way our businesses yeah. we don't we don't give people a fix for a problem yeah. uh, we give them a solution that they can use to yes. fix the problem their, themselves exactly. uh, I, I think we're same in that way i love that so yeah with that it was really great to have you here adrian and i loved the conversation we had and i hope you did too and hopefully everybody who's listening found this to be an amazing and inspiring conversation and enables you if you're the right person listening right now to make the shift you want to let that be with starting something being creative initiating something in your journey or just overcoming a limitation that you felt is not possible to overcome or you never you felt like there's no way out of it but through this podcast you have been able to find something that allows you to look at things from a different perspective and enable yourself and your business or your community to be able to scale and make the shift happen uh, yeah, thank you for having me on. Uh, this was really great. I really enjoy talking to creatives like yourself and having these types of conversations. Uh, so if anyone wants to reach out uh, or look more into Frento, you can find it at frento.io and you can find me on LinkedIn.